It's interesting. When events within our world, natural occurrences and so forth, hurricanes and tornadoes and various things of that nature, it's interesting to see how oftentimes people respond to it. It's not uncommon for some individuals to apply some sort of biblical sign to the events that take place. And you'll hear someone say, well, that must have been a sign from God about this or a sign from God about that. The question is, do we really know what the sign we're supposed to be, what sign we're supposed to be looking at? We're going to be looking at this morning. Before we begin with the lesson, I want to thank everyone for being here and let you know it's always a wonderful opportunity when we come together to worship our Heavenly Father. We have those visiting here with us. We want you to know that you're a welcome guest. If maybe you hear something that sparks a question, don't hesitate to come up and talk to us afterwards. Give us a chance to study with you from the wonderful Word of God. So here's the question for this morning as we begin the lesson. Are we observing the sign? Are we observing the sign? You go back in Bible history, you find that God has used signs often. And, and keep in mind, let me go and say this now, so I don't, just in case I forget later. A sign always followed or confirmed a message that was stated. The sign really wasn't the important part. Okay? The message is what was important. The message, the statement, the declaration, the warning, whatever it might be within the context, that's what people needed to listen to. But oftentimes the Lord gave a sign as support of or to confirm these statements. Let me give you a couple examples here. We're going to look at two that comes from King Hezekiah. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Kings. We're going to be there for two examples. 2 Kings chapter 19. You'll notice here with King Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 19. Observe with me here in verses 29 through 31 what we find written here. He says, This shall be a sign to you. You shall eat this year, such as grows of itself, and in the second year, what springs from the same, also in the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards, and eat the fruit of them. And the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Go out of Jerusalem, shall, or for out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and those who escape from Mount Zion, the seal of the Lord of hosts, will be this. Now, if you were to back up, you see God's discussion here through Isaiah with the son of Hezekiah, going, away, going all the way back up to verse 20. And God's giving him reassurance that even though uh, Sennacherib and all those Assyria is going to appear to be a threat, that for all intents and purposes, the Lord is going to be with them and a remnant is going to remain. But here's the important point for the lesson. Verse 29, there's a sign that they would see. There would be prosperity in the land for three years. And this prosperity for three years. Notice that you shall eat this year, such as grows of itself. In the second year, what springs from the same. Also in the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards, and eat the fruit of them. This would be a sign. This prosperity. That the remnant would remain. That the Lord is there for the children of Israel. Specifically of Judah under the reign of Hezekiah. Look at another sign found a little bit later in Hezekiah's life. We turn over to chapter 20. Hezekiah receives word from the Lord that um, he's going to live a little bit longer. That the Lord is going to extend his life for, for a little bit longer of a period of time, some, some 15 years. And so Hezekiah says to the Lord, what is the sign what is the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord the third day? What's the sign? How, how, how do I know this? Isaiah said, this is a sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing which he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go backward 10 degrees? Hezekiah answered, it is an easy thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. He says, no, but let the shadow go backward 10 degrees. So Isaiah the prophet cried out to the Lord, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backward, by which it had gone down on the sundial of Ahaz. 
You know, sometimes the signs were God, was God manipulating natural occurrences. Other times, the sign was an occurrence that was miraculous. Um, when the, remember with the story of Gideon, the, Gideon wanted to know for certain that he would have the victory that God promised him. God uses the example of the fleece and, and being put outside. And one morning the whole ground would be wet, wet and the fleece dry. And the next morning the fleece would be wet and all the ground around it dry. So Lord controlling these events. Using these events to confirm the message that he had given. Another interesting one, and this takes us backwards in time a little bit. Turn with me over to 1 Samuel. This is with the, uh, e, the judge Eli, 2 Samuel. And note with me there in verse 2, 1 Samuel is where we're going. 1 Samuel chapter 2, and let me draw your attention there to verses 27 through 34. Now remember, Eli's sons had been very wicked before the Lord. And so the Lord is passing judgment on them. And so he says, beginning in verse 27, Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt to Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer up my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? And so he goes on, Why do you kick at my sacrifice? And he continues. But notice with me there specifically, there in, pick up there in verse 31. He says, Therefore the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. And you will see an enemy in my dwelling place, despite all the good which God has done for Israel. Now verse 34, let's jump to there. Now this shall be a sign to you that you will come upon your two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas, in one day they shall die, both of them. Then I'll raise it for myself a faithful high priest. Now, here's what, well, here's what he's saying to Eli. This is everything that the Lord says is going to happen to your family. And all of your family is going to die, and, and, and you're, they're going to pay the price for what they've done. But here's going to be the sign. This is how you will know. He says, it will come upon your two sons. One day they shall die, both of them. So the point is, is that God used signs throughout history to confirm the word, to, to, to back up, not really back up, but, but to confirm the message to be true and that when you see these things happening, th then you'll know. Well, what is interesting, if we jump forward real quick to the New Testament, we see that God continued during the New Testament times to use signs to confirm the messages which were presented. Notice with me in Hebrews, we're going to turn to chapter 1, or chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And for right now, I want to draw your attention specifically in Hebrews chapter 2. Let's, let's look down, if you would, to verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. So, that's why we see the apostles healing individuals. Why we see Jesus performing miracles. Why Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Why Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath day, as we looked at this morning in John chapter 9. Why these things were done, they were in effect signs, they were wonders to confirm the message that was being spoken so that people might believe. In Mark chapter 16, 17 through 18, he goes on to tell the apostles that they're going to do many signs within his name, that there are going to be things that they will do that God will use as a sign to confirm the message given. But now here's the thing. All throughout history, not everyone has accepted the sign of God. And most of the time, the reason why people reject the sign is because they reject the message. You cannot have an individual to reject the message of God but believe the sign. The signs were given simply to confirm the message. So if you reject the message, you're going to reject the sign that God would have given. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter, or 1 Chronicles, <laughs> one more time, 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1, verse 22. There are some individuals, that they don't care about what God has given. They don't care about the message of the cross. There's only one thing that they want, and that is to see some sort of sign. They'll seek after the sign and ignore the message, and better yet, to reject the message of God. 
And he says in 1 Corinthians 1, for the Jews that they request a sign. The Greeks, they seek after wisdom. But you notice what they're missing. They're missing the fundamental message behind it. Over in Luke chapter 11, and in a couple of minutes, we're going to, we're going to spend a few minutes there in Luke 11 and Mark 12. But notice at the start of Luke 11, verse 29, here you have a, a, a crowd that gathers around. And they, they say, you know, Rabbi, show us a sign. Well, he says this is an evil generation. It seeks after a sign. And you would think, well, hey, they want a sign so they might believe the truth. No, 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 no. They're rejecting the truth. They just like, they want to see a sign. That's all they're concerned about. There are some individuals who would even believe false signs. Mark warns about this, or Jesus warns about this in Mark 13. And in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9, they talk about these false teachers. They'll appear to do signs. They'll appear to do wonders. You know, I think about in our modern-day culture, you turn on the television set or go on to YouTube or wherever, and you're going to find supposed preachers supposedly healing people. And what happens is you have individuals who will be convinced by their fake sign to believe the fake message because they don't want to believe the truth. They don't want to accept the truth that has already been confirmed by God. But brethren, let me tell you this morning, we're going to talk about one sign that remains. There is one sign that remains that everybody must see. I do not believe the Bible teaches that the Lord will use any other signs. I don't believe earthquakes are signs. They're a sign that maybe we should drop, stop drilling if you believe that. Hurricanes, I don't think they're a sign from God. They might make you think about where you're going to live afterwards. All the catastrophes that happen, I do not believe that they're signs from God of how terrible the world has been and the world is. It's just the way that God has set the world to function. There's one sign that God has given us, and it was a sign that was given to the generation that he talked to 2,000 years ago. And it was a sign that was sufficient for the people then, and it's a sign that is sufficient for the people today. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 12. We're going to look at a parallel account of a conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees. I'm going to bring both of those up there. We're going to turn over first off to Matthew chapter 12. So Travis asked me before the lesson, he says, do you think you'll get, all, get through all the charts this morning? And I confidently said, sure. Maybe not. We have to continue this tonight. But notice, beginning in Matthew chapter 12, we're going to start there in verse 38. Some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now notice his response. God didn't respond to Gideon this way. He didn't respond to Hezekiah this way. Notice how Jesus responded to these people. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And he says, And no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. Now turn over to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. This is Luke's recording of the same statement. He records it just a bit differently, but the primary point of the message is still the same. Luke eleven twenty nine. 29, And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also, also the Son of Man will be to the generation. The Queen of the South will rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Now, if you kind of break both passages down, we're going to put them together here, and break them down. Here's what we see. And this is what Jesus was saying to them. First off, 
He says, only an evil generation seeks a sign. A true believer is not going to seek after a sign because they've already been convicted by the message. They're willing to listen to the message. Yes, God did do signs and wonders to confirm the message that was being preached. And there were individuals who weren't convicted until they saw the sign. Think about Paul on his, the road to Damascus. I mean, just days prior, he was arresting Christians. But because of what he saw, how the Lord appeared to him, and because he was struck blind and then received a sight, he knew, he knew who he needed to follow. And it was told to him what to do. And that's what Paul did. So sometimes, yes, a sign was needed. But Christ here is talking about a generation that's already rejected him. They've made the decision not to listen to him. Show us a sign. They don't really want a sign. It's much like in our, in our Isaiah study. In Isaiah chapter 7, we were looking at Isaiah's uh, warning to King Ahaz. He goes to Ahaz, and, he, and he's trying to comfort him. He's trying to tell him that God will protect him against the Syrians and, and the northern nation of Israel. And Isaiah says, ask for a sign, and God will give you a sign. And Ahaz says, no, I don't want to bother God with a sign. He almost sounds a bit noble until Isaiah replies that he's rejecting God, that he's unwilling to listen to God's help and assurance. Ahaz rejected the message. He was an evil man. And as a result, he rejected what God was offering him to confirm the promise if he simply would have heard. So as an evil generation, all they wanted was a sign. So Jesus says, all right, there's going to be only one sign given, the sign of Jonah. That's an interesting statement. What do you mean by that, a sign of Jonah? Well, here's essentially what, what I believe he's referring to. First off, God told Jonah to go preach to the Ninevites. And the text says that he was assigned to the Ninevites. God gave him a message. He went and preached. He was the sign to the Ninevites that confirmed the message that God was delivering to him. But even more so, the text breaks down for us that Jonah was in the fish for three days and three nights. Can you imagine, assuming he didn't shower, what Jonah may have looked like and smelt like after being vomited up on the dry ground, spending three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, and now he's traipsing through town preaching? Maybe he was known. Maybe the people knew about this great miracle. He was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights. And when he came out, and he, he went preaching to the people of Nineveh. And here's the powerful thing about it. They believed him. They listened to him. They repented at his message. And so what does Jesus say? He says the men of Nineveh, they're going to rise up in judgment against that evil and wicked generation. How would they rise up in judgment? Well, because they heard the message and they repented. The message was brought to them by Jonah. A man named Jonah brought them the message and they believed and they repented. And he says, and there's someone here who is greater than Jonah. Someone here who has spent, who will spend three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. And you're not going to listen to him. You're not going to receive his message. So the men of Nineveh will rise up at judgment in condemnation of you because they heard, they repented, and you rejected someone greater than them. But it doesn't stop there, though. He uses another example. He refers to this queen of the south, who traveled high and low to hear the great wisdom of Solomon. She traveled a long distance so that, that, that she might see whether or not all the, 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 everything she had heard about Solomon was true. And she wanted to learn. She wanted to know. And so she's going to rise up at the judgment against this generation. Because here they have someone who is greater than Solomon. And he's right there with them. And they're not willing to put forth any effort whatsoever to consider and to listen to what he is saying. Now think about that for a moment. Here is someone who doesn't, we don't know much about. But yet we know that she traveled high and low to hear 
And these people aren't willing to listen to one who is even greater than Solomon. Brethren, it really makes us stop and think. We'll talk about this here in a few minutes, but it really makes us stop and think. You look at all the cases in the Old Testament of people who disobeyed God. Look at the New Testament, people who went against God. What makes us think we're going to be any different if we choose to go against him? We would be no better. I mean, the Ninevites would be better than us if we were to walk away from the message of God. The Queen of the South would be better than us if we were to reject and walk away from the message. This is, this is his point. But now, let's turn back to the Matthew text. Matthew, it's interesting the differences of the gospel. What we're about to read, Luke places it earlier in the conversation. Matthew places it where he does. And I believe that in the context, the allegory we're about to read more accurately fits the placement that Matthew uses because of the message that it illustrates regarding this wicked generation. Notice in Matthew chapter 12, let's continue our reading now. And let's pick up there in verse 43. Jesus continues, after having just talked about the, the, the one being greater than Solomon. He says here, beginning in verse 43, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Matthew ties this here. And we see the thread that stitches it together in his use of the word generation. Jesus said an evil and adulterous generation there in verse 39. And then he talks about the men of Nineveh rising up against this generation in 41, the queen of the south rising up against, in judgment against this generation in 42, and then verse 45, so shall it also be with this wicked generation. So real quick, what is this allegory? Well, it's real simple. It's representing the state of these people. Here you have a man with an unclean spirit. The cl unclean spirit leaves the man. That's wonderful. That's great. But when... The unclean spirit finds nowhere to go. It comes back to the man. And you know what? The house is still empty. And not just still empty, but there's nothing there. It's been swept and clean and everything. And so he comes in and brings seven more unclean spirits worse than him. How could that possibly ref be referring to this wicked generation? Well, my suggestion might, is this, that what Christ is talking about is a state of anyone who openly rejects the gospel's call. You think about it, the Pharisees had been given the law of Moses. And they had problems with the law of Moses. They, they struggled to, to uh, observe that law. Matter of fact, they would modify it some and teach for doctrine the commandments of men. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 15, verse 9. Well, that Mosaic law was being taken away. And something better was about to come in. This new covenant of Christ. But you know, if they were unwilling to obey the Mosaic law and accepted the way that they were supposed to have, there's no way they were going to accept what Jesus was trying to bring. And now it's not just some law given to the Israelites on Mount Sinai. We're talking about a new covenant altogether that would bring to them salvation if they would simply listen to it. Jeremiah in chapter 31, beginning verse 31, he spoke about this wonderful covenant. This covenant wherein all of our sins would no longer be remembered well, we would be a part of this, this household of God, this, this beautiful aspect of life. But when an individual hears the word of God and openly walks away from it, they're no different than the generation that Jesus was talking to. Because the word has been preached, they have heard it, and they're unwilling to listen to it. We're not talking about the person here that is undecided and, and ultimately comes to a knowledge of the truth and obeys. We're talking about the person who says, I have no interest in it altogether. And there's no belief in their hearts whatsoever. I really believe the allegory is illustrating their state. And so what we have here, you know, here we have the current Jewish leaders. They rejected Jesus. They rejected everything he said. And the ultimate sign that, he would, that they would receive they would reject that as well. And God would give them no more signs. There's only one more sign that was coming. He's telling them, the sign of Jonah, the sign of the Son of Man. And that's what was so important. So what was this great sign for all to see? 
Well, as we said, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This sign that he's talking about of the Son of Man, I believe, if I understand the context right, is talking about his death, burial, and his resurrection. Someone would say, well, how do we know the things that Jesus taught was true? There he is walking after he died and was buried. Think about that. Think about that for a moment. This was the sign, this was the last sign for all intents and purposes that would be given. And it was a sign that would trans, that would last throughout time. Someone says, why don't we have miracles today? There's no longer a need to confirm the word of God. It's already been confirmed. The only time you would need to confirm anything is if you're going to make it up and have something new. And then you bring in the false signs and everything. So with that said, and understanding that the sign of the Son of Man is going to be the death, the burial, resurrection of Christ, Him being raised from the dead, never to die again. question for us is, are we observing that sign? And what I mean by that, and this is talking about both who are not Christians and those who have obeyed the gospel, are we continuing to look? Are we looking at that event, that miracle, that wonderful event, event that occurred and letting it confirm within our hearts and our minds the message of salvation found within the word of God think about this for a moment through whom did God speak well according to Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 he spoke through us through his son let's start there for just a moment Hebrews chapter 1 and let's read we're going to begin there in 1 we'll read down through verse 4 real quick he says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoken time past to the fathers by the prophets, he says, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Jesus even said in, his, in John chapter 12 that the things that he taught, he taught of the Father. They were, it was what the Father wanted him to speak. And so someone might ask, how do we know that what Jesus taught truly came from God? Look. He has arisen from the grave. He has arisen from the grave never to die again. And in so doing, when we believe that, we appeal to the wisdom of God. We don't appeal to the wisdom of man. And this is where many individuals end up stumbling. For whatever reason, this whole concept of Jesus dying upon the cross and being raised from the dead is foolishness to them. And they just can't look past their own ignorance, their own what they would call to be wisdom. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, he says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, he said, this is the power of God. He says, For it is written, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to, un to, bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the disputer of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of this message preached to save those who believe. The Jews request a sign. <clears throat> Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. There's the message. And what better confirmation for the message of Christ being crucified, what better possible confirmation could there be than the actual death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the sign. That is what we need to be looking towards. We need to appeal to the wisdom of God. We need to believe the message because the message has been confirmed by the sign of his resurrection and believe in that. You know, oftentimes we talk about Romans 10, 9 and 10 and we talk about the plan of salvation. Brethren, I would suggest that Romans 10, 9 and 10 doesn't simply apply to when one wants to become a Christian. It is a must to remain faithful unto God after one becomes a child of God. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. He says you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But so we don't miss the point, you have to believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. You've got to believe that the sign that we are appealing to actually took place. And it confirmed the wonderful message. 
And if as Christians, if we ever stop believing that, we will be lost. Because when you reject the sign, you're really rejecting the message. And remember, in Hebrews chapter 2, there have been others who have gone before us who have rejected the counsel of God. They have rejected the word of God. And notice what the scripture says about them. Therefore, Hebrews 2 verse 1, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Rather, the signs there. All you've got to do is open your Bible and study it, and you'll see the sign. You'll see the sign of the Son of Man. You'll see the sign that was given to confirm the Word of God. If you study the Word of God, if you accept the message of the Word of God, you'll see the sign that is there. And that sign will serve as a confirmation of what God has done so that you and I might be saved. Here's what we need to remember. We need to remember to look. To look at the message. Study it. If you're not a Christian and you've been wondering about this, let us sit down and study with you from the Word of God. Let us study with you and show you about sin and the dangers of sin and what Christ did, what the Father did, so that your sins could be forgiven. And the ultimate goal is to believe and be to study and be convicted. You know, the idea of faith in that context is the idea of conviction, of persuasion. And the more you study the Bible, the ultimate goal is that you'll see the signs that God did in confirmation of the Word, and then be convicted that the message is true and that you must obey it. That you must do what it says. It says on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. You know, Peter said, this man whom you've crucified, God has made both Lord and Savior. Well, you know, when they heard this, they were pricked in the heart. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were convicted by the message. And they wanted to know what they had to do to change. Peter told them in verse 38 to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Notice that. They had to have believe enough to turn away from their sins and obey his command to be baptized. Then their sins would be forgiven. And they would rise up, as Paul says in Romans 6, to walk in this newness of life. But one more point, and then the lesson will be yours. If we reject the message, we're not just talking about those who have not yet made the decision to become Christian. We're talking about all, to everybody. If any of us ever decides to reject the message of the cross, then we've rejected the sign that God has given. We don't want to be in that state. There's a reason why Jesus told the brethren in Revelation 2.10 to be faithful unto death and you'll receive the crown of righteousness. There's a reason why he tells them that. Because if we will endure, if we will persevere, then we will have eternity with God in heaven. But only if we'll observe and recognize the sign that God has already given us through the death of his son upon the cross of Calvary and his resurrection from the grave. If you're not a Christian, you need to become one. You can have all your sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb if you'll simply believe enough to repent of your sins and to obey his command to be baptized. Then you'll rise up to walk in this newness of life. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully, why not? Have you looked away from the sign? Look back to it today and be convicted to be restored back to your fellowship with the Father. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward now as we stand and as we sing.